I wish what you was doing was there when I walked in when I was 15. Maybe my journey would have, would have been less less of a struggle at that point in time if I'd had access to something like that. Like they started this incredible program called the Youth Campus. All right, everyone, welcome to the next edition of the Impact Policy Podcast. I'm joined here today by local legend and leader Adam Thompson. Uh, he's going to spend some time today having a yarn to us about all things community development, leadership, coaching, young people, the public sector, you name it, he's done it. Um, and we're so grateful that we can have him here. Um, I won't go through his whole introduction. I'll give him some space to share his story a little bit um, and then we can have a good yarn. So, Tomo, welcome, my bro. Yeah, thanks, mate. Good to be sitting here with a fellow 2037 boy <laughs> yeah. from, uh, from Glebe. So, uh, yeah, I'm really proud of what you're doing, mate. And, um, and yeah, just a real honour to be here with you today. Yeah, thanks, bro. It's so good to have you. Maybe we could kick off just by you sharing a little bit about yourself, your journey. You've had a really interesting sort of trajectory with your career. Um, and, yeah, maybe just start there. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I grew up in Glebe, um, down in the Housing Commission down there at um, Glebe Street, Franklin Street. Um, anyone from around that area knows that, that, <laughs> yeah. that, little, that little lot pretty well. Um, you know, single mum, uh, younger sister, you know, you know, we had a lot of the struggles that a lot of people in that area had at that time, those kind of 80s, 90s social housing, um, a lot of crime, a lot of different things going on. Um, but, uh, look, the most consistent thing was there was plenty of love in there, you know, mm. and, you know, Mum was flawed like we all are and, yeah. you know, made mistakes and, you know, but she, the, the one thing that was real constant was, was that, was that love and that kindness. And mm -hmm. I think if, if, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll deep dive in it, but that consistency in whatever form yeah. it comes into, totally, um, is totally. so important. So yeah, no, I did really well. It's like, I was, you know, I was pretty, a really good student. Um, I got to about year nine, 10 and the, the inner rat bag <laughs> decided <laughs> to come out a little bit yeah, and, um, it, yeah as it does and um kind of hit a, a couple of hurdles as a, and, and you know i think um by any measure I, I probably didn't reach my potential from an educational standpoint mm -hmm. um uh but i i had dreams at a certain point of being a, some kind of singer or musician i, I didn't yeah, like okay. a few pipes mate don't yeah, mind mate, uh, look out. don't mind you know dropping a tune or two so yeah. i'd um i applied to get into the australian institute of music actually for yeah, vocals, okay. yeah uh, wow. when i was when i was a kid and i got in and then i thought oh i'll just defer because i've I was leaning right into my rat bag, uh, rat bagness <laughs> and that. So yeah, I just enjoying time with the boys and yeah. you know, and the girls and, yeah. and whatever else. And um, during that time, I um, <laughs> like I said, didn't mind having a sing. I was getting up on a local karaoke night up at uh, the Unity Hall Hotel. I think it's known <laughs> yeah, of the workers yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Two dollar fifty drinks back then. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> um, anyway, I used to get up, or you know, have a sing. All the you know, all the boys are there, yeah, and yeah. we have always good laugh every Thursday night. Anyway, the guy running it. Because after a few, I'd, I stopped singing and start telling a few gags and geeing up and everything on the crowd. And, and the guy said, oh, mate, do you, do you want a job? I went, job? What are you, what are you talking about? Then he goes, mate, I'll... He goes, just to host one of these shows and, you know, sing a couple of songs and just intro. But I said, yeah. oh, I don't know, man. He goes, I'll give you $150 for three three hours yeah. and free drinks all night. Ha mate, how old? 18. <laughs> so yeah. I'm thinking... Big, big money too, How good is this, yeah. right, you know? So I uh, started doing that. Anyway, I did that for a while. I started I taught myself how to DJ because he was just an agent who was kind of booking different acts and we got on great and, uh, you know, started, yeah, like I said, started DJing and, and doing a couple of different things. So I was just doing anything anyone would pay me for in that yeah, entertainment yeah. type space. Totally. Um, and then kind of, as I was doing, I was getting... Just enjoyed, you can probably tell, I didn't mind talking, you know, I could talk my way through a bowl of porridge. So um, so I just enjoyed that part of it. And I, I liked the challenge and it's probably an insight into my character a bit. I found when I sang, yeah. even if you were rubbish, people give you a little kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, on you, good on you for having a go. Yeah. But when you're trying to be funny, people don't laugh. Yeah, if yeah, you're yeah. not funny, they don't laugh. Yeah. And that sick part of me was like, well, that's tougher. Like, mm. I like that challenge, you know? Yeah, okay. Um. That was a failure. I was a failed stand-up comic. I figured that out pretty quick. But through that work, um, a lady saw me, um, came, was at one of my shows, and she said, oh, you don't want to be doing this karaoke garbage all your life, do you? I said, oh, no. I, I've actually applied to get into afters for the radio broadcasting yeah, course. Yeah. She goes, I might be able to help you. And she slipped me this card quite late at night. I couldn't see in the dark. I went off and, oh. <laughs> And it was this lady Half at cut, the yeah. time, her name was is it Sammy Power, and she was one of the mm. biggest radio, breakfast radio personalities 
in Sydney at the time. I went, yeah, wow. I, it was one of those moments, you know, when a girl, you know, it probably didn't happen to me much, but I've seen <laughs> in the movies, girl sleeps your number that goes off in the darkness. Yeah. It was that kind of moment. I've gone, oh, where is she? And I called her and... So I got to go into this breakfast show and, mate, it, the bug got me straight yeah. away. I was just like, it was just manic. There's people running around. But I got offered a job at the same time. And so, yeah, that started my uh, my media journey, which has played a pretty big role in terms of my career and, mm. and, and life after that. So, yeah, I was in radio for about five years yeah, from okay. that point. So different roles, off air, um, on air. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, anyone who knows me knows I love sport. I was yep. a bit of a rain man with sport. New stats just could could hold them. Mm-hmm. You know, good at a sports trivia night. Um, and a job came up at Sports Tonight on Channel Ten. I completely wasn't qualified for it. Yep. You know, I'd only just started doing sports reading, and um, and I wasn't even doing it full time. I was just doing it a bit while I did mm-hmm. my comedy gibber on the side. But yep. I love sport. Really, really loved it. Anyway, I went for this job. Was completely not qualified. And in the interview. It was acknowledged that, <laughs> hey, mate, obviously he, he pointed to the uh, bloke interviewing me and said, mate, pointed to this pile of resumes and he goes, look, I've got to be honest, mate, you're the least qualified person here. Yeah, he goes, okay. like, why would I give you this job? Yeah. And I said, look, I am probably the least qualified person, but you won't find, you might find someone who work as hard as me, but you mm. will never find anyone who work harder. I'll yeah. outwork everyone in your room. I uh, guarantee okay. you that much. Yeah. You know, got a call back, said, mate, I'm going to give you the job. <laughs> so that's wow. that, like, started working a bit more behind the scenes. And what I found in that environment was I really enjoyed the managing part of it. So mm. I started to move away. I just like leading people, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, in, in my outside of my work life, I, I started coaching. I was coaching mm. A grade in the South Comp as a 20 year old. Like, <laughs> I, I was like, they, they, I was just very comfortable in that environment. Mm. And, um, yeah, and then, look, TV kind of fell through the bottom as the inter- internet grew. A lot yep. of the television stations did a lot of redundancies and, and whatever. And it's was kind of at a bit of a precipice about, oh, what next? And um, I decided, you know what, like, mm. there's things out there for me. I don't know what it looks like yet, but, yep. you know, there was a few, um, probably a bit like yourself. What was happening in the background of my brain was um, I was really, really into my combat sports at the time. Mm. And I... Uh, you know, a journalist, you know, you're very inquisitive, mm. you know, and in the boxing game and the fight game, I, I'd done everything you could do as far as not fighting. I'd mm. been in corners, gone to the States for camps, mm. spoken to the biggest promoters in the world, like Dana White, and had yep. sit downs with him. Um, I seen you, know, you do a few been there tours in overseas. Fights. I yeah, seen you do some tours stuff overseas. overseas. Yeah, did, did some things overseas, commentated fights, mm. been in the corner of fighters, mm. done all these things. But the only thing I hadn't done was was actually have a fight mm. and uh i remember i was at a gig with danny green and uh, he was getting ready for a fight and he was such i was managing the media for him mm. and he was just you know he's just being really despondent and rude to everyone i'm like mate that's not danny like danny's one of the nicest guys ever yeah, i, I yeah. wonder why he's being so rude to all these people you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> i couldn't understand it and after he's going oh i'm fucking so hungry i'm really hungry yeah, yeah. You know? i'm like okay i okay. can't wait he's, but i wasn't clicking for me because i yep. hadn't had that lived experience right totally so i knew there was these gaps so i had this time off and i thought oh god we've got money there mm-hmm. you know I've, what you'll learn by the end of this podcast i've got a very understanding wife um <laughs> I, had, I had this money there kind of I had this idea of you know what if we took this reasonably overweight journo yeah, yeah. and we gave him a professional fight camp for three and a half months yeah you know? and uh of this idea of the fight project where we transform me put a staff around me of like 11 yeah sports staff everyone from coaches and basically transform me from being an overweight journo yeah, yeah. into someone resembling an mma fighter after three and a half months and um mate really one of the greatest things i've ever done yeah in, wow. in my life so um yeah we did this transformation i you know in three and a half months I went from i lost 28 kilos and fought it Fought at, um, yeah, fought at 72 kilograms um, in an MMA fight. Mm. Didn't go my way on the night. Made a few tactical errors on my part. <laughs> yeah. Enjoyed throwing hands too much. I, I, <laughs> through that kind of process, I, I, I actually got quite competent in my jiu-jitsu. Yeah, the yeah, game yeah. plan was, let's get this guy to the ground. We'll yeah, just submit yeah, yeah. him and get it done. And I just didn't follow my coach's instructions. Yeah, nat- which is funny now as a, a coach. Natural, natural boxer in your mind. Oh, I know, mate. Well, it's funny <laughs> as a coach now. I'm always pulling my hair out when my boxers don't <laughs> listen to me. But... Um, but uh, that was a really, really important journey for me because it, it just kind of 
I was so career driven. Like mm. everything was about career. Mm. Like you know, everything I did, everywhere I moved, the people circles I moved with. You know, so, if it wasn't in some way benefiting what I was going to do and my goals career wise, then it, in some ways it didn't matter. Yep. You know, um, but I was like, oh, you know, and it was about the same time. So this is about 2012. I got reintroduced because I was a PCYC kid growing up. Yep. Um, but I got reintroduced to the PCYC at Woolloomooloo. Yeah, and that's where I first I'd jump in because that's when yeah. I first heard of you properly because I'd seen you around and then like, yes, I knew you did stuff with the footy. Yeah. Like, yeah, you coaches, I think like a few mutual friends that probably would have played on teams that you coached. And then I remember thinking, because, you know, we both have a strong connection, PCYC. I remember thinking, what? what's this? This guy is, is a really successful, you know, corporate sort of lad in that space. <laughs> What's he come back down to PCYC to do all this sort of stuff and asked around I said what do you know about this Tomo guy okay. and they said they said bah he just loves like sport community like you know he's just trying to do stuff that's really in line with his passion and all that sort of stuff and so that's when I sort of first was like okay you know and we start, I started to pay attention to you a bit your journey and watch what you're doing at PCYC but yeah, let's let's hear about some of that. Yeah, so um, like essentially, uh, I was uh, sound like a name dropper here, but I was writing um, I was writing Brad Fittler's book. Yeah. And the way we do it is we meet down with a couple of other mates, James Dack, who's yep. heavily involved with the PCYC, um, and Holly, uh, who we're both yep. uh, very fond yep. of. She's the impact uh, she, policy guru here. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So she was um, she was with us. Uh, she was down there as the youth worker and she came past one morning and she goes, oh, God's going to train with you. And we said, yeah, 100% I'll get involved. Yeah. And she said, oh, do you mind if I bring down a couple of kids? So we're training down there and then she's brought a couple of kids and those couple of kids turned into a couple more kids. And yeah. all of a sudden we've got about 12 kids down there yeah. training with myself, Freddie, James and, da- and Dave and Holly. Anyway, we get to the end of, uh, and just organically, I just ended up running the sessions. <laughs> But I don't even know it wasn't a conscious the, decision, but that, I just the natural up, leader and coaching, or whatever you know. it was. But I just I went straight into coach mode when we had yeah. all those people there. Freddie and I got the end of our book, wrote the book, all good. And Holly said, "I, this has been awesome. You know, mm. would how would you feel about staying around and continuing the the program in the morning?" Mm. I said, "Oh yeah, like it's part of my life now, so no dramas at all." So. I just stayed and ran this Spartan training program for the, the local kids. And yeah. um, it was just, it was literally turning into the best part of my week. And yeah, wow. that kind of started my volunteering journey with PCYC. That was about 2012. Mm. Um, Holly, oh, I got this young fella. Yeah, Do you yeah, want to yeah. come have a chat? And I said, yeah. yeah, no worries. And they started this incredible program called the Youth Campus. And um, basically the premise of the Youth Campus, it was capturing year nine and year 10 students have kind of fallen away from the school system. Mm-hmm. Um, that traditional learning model just, it just didn't Not work working. for them, right? It wasn't working. Totally. And um, this is a way for them to get their year 10 equivalent through mm-hmm. TAFE. So we had a partnership through TAFE and Catholic Care. Yep. Um, and then, uh, but also build some other things around them because they need to learn different. So Definitely, you know, definitely. Th- they, we introduced a program called The Right Journey. And I don't know if, uh, if you haven't had a chance to look it up. Um, it's, it's an incredible um, program, which is really about rites of passage you yeah, know in this yeah. modern you know you look at uh older cultures you know um like our indigenous culture there's mm. always these rites of passages now totally. in traditional western culture we think 16th 21st yeah. marriage yeah. death yeah they're all these major milestones where in traditional cultures mm. there's a bunch of other milestones totally you know, you know whether whether it's uh you know uh the, the tribes in africa that need to go and hunt something mm. and bring that back to their tribe and that's how mm. they you know show that they're moving into adulthood i started my my path as a um as a mentor in that program and um really one of the more powerful things i've ever had the opportunity to be a part of mm. and, and played a huge role you know, whilst all this is happening, I'm still doing my media career. Yeah, I set up yeah, my own yeah. agency and yep. was doing really, really well. Um, but I got to a point in that where I was volunteering and that's where my love was and my passion was, mm. was working with young people. But there was a clash, you know, because inevitably there will be, you know, I've got totally. a career and, and totally. what I need to do there. And I decided once again, very understanding wife, <laughs> that I was just, I was, took a two year sabbatical from my work and yep. um, I took over from Holly as the manager. Yep. Um, I think we did some really great work. I took some of the business acumen I had and I, I wanted mm. to apply it 
um, to, to the way we did charity. We weren't really approaching our business, PCYC, and, and obviously I was working at more of a local level yeah. as a social enterprise. Totally. Because that's what PCYC is, right? I looked at all the things I could do down there, like, oh, I could do this, and that, mm. but I thought, what it needs from me, it actually needs me to take my stuff from my yeah. career and apply it into this space. Totally. And, um, we, we had some really, really good years. I, I think in total, we brought in nearly a million a commitment of nearly a million dollars in, in fundraising money yeah, wow. um, just for that club alone mm. uh, down there which funded things like youth campus um, things like our boxing program um, and ninja warrior program which yeah, has become okay. a signature program down yeah, at Wollo yeah. um, all these type of things and and it was great because it what it did for me it, it cemented kind of what I already knew mm. which was my purpose yeah. and uh, I think understanding your purpose is a superpower. Totally. And I always say, like, and people are going to take their own time to get to that point. Um, but for me, that two years was an investment in understanding my purpose. Mm, you know? Totally. So, so, you know, we all, you know, we all have families, you know, you know, obviously that, but for me, that's, that's my responsibility. Mm. That's not my purpose. That's my no, responsibility 100%. is to provide for my family, give them a good upbringing, give them good structure, all that type of thing, mm. give them love. That's my, that's my, responsibility that's my totally, job totally but my purpose is different and mm. and the two years i invested uh down there gave me a really really clear picture of what my purpose was mm. um that i wanted to have a positive impact on community mm. you know i had to find ways to do that totally. and constantly challenge myself to do more and that was my purpose so when i got back into into my i guess after my two-year sabbatical, mm. it was, I was I felt so empowered, you know, yep. because I, I I went into you know whether I was speaking to people about joining their organisations or whatever, like yeah, I, I'm here. This is what I can bring to the table. Mm. But just so you're aware, I do this. Mm. Nothing can stand in the way of that. Totally. Because that makes me better. It makes me a better dad. Makes me a better husband. Mm. It makes me a better work colleague, and it makes me a better leader. And we just started from scratch, and you mm. know, there was a lot of doubt in terms of our ability to. I said, look. If no one comes for two months, that's okay. Yeah, totally. If there's three kids in here, yeah. well, I've won, you know. Mm. You know. So we started the youth boxing program up, and um, it's it's just it's been incredible. Um, I think there's there's a lot of power in what you just said around um, consistency, showing up, and um, you know, it might be no kids for two months, or it might just be one. Something that you just said then, and I feel like what I've seen around stuff that's been really successful has been those simple ingredients of consistency and showing up particularly in our communities mm. when families can be fragmented or there can be complex issues at home um, it's the consistency of a safe space uh, outlet a boxing program um, you know for the long term that 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 generates momentum you know i think about um, the tribal warrior boxing stuff at redfern right they've been going for probably similar sort of time yeah. about 10 over 10 years mm. And, um, you know... Shout out Uncle Shane. Shout out Uncle Shane, like, showing up. Like, Damn. for anything else, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that program runs and everybody knows. So, kid, numbers will go up, numbers will go down. Yep. They've had hundreds, they've had tens. Yep. But they're always there and it's consistent yep. and it's not determined on funding cycles, rounds, um, you know, ministerial directions, all that sort of stuff. Yep. It's, it's community and people showing up and being committed. And in, and in the long term, I think that's, that's how stuff grows, right? Because I look at the impact that you're having now and it's, that's, the in, that's the investment of that consistent 10-year relationship with that community and that place. Um, that's, that's like, it's almost like the seed, the key ingredient, you know? And, and it's funny, consistency. We think consistency, will, consistency can have a long-term impact. But from what I've seen, it can actually have a real good short-term impact because mm. a lot of the kids we're dealing with and a lot of the time, one of the things they don't have is consistency. Yeah. First came to PCYC Willow because I got into a fight at the group home and got a hiding and thought, F I don't know how to fight. I've got to learn how to box. I wish I took up jiu-jitsu then. Yeah, of course. So, <laughs> but I thought boxing was yeah, the course. answer, right? So I went walked into Willow, yeah. 15, 16, um, and there was no youth boxing program. So I wore it by myself, tried to do my best. Um, some people would give me a bit of attention. You know, boxing is a fickle sport at the best of times, right? Sink or swim. Yep. I stuck around for maybe almost a year. I wish what you was doing was there when I walked in when I was 15. Mm. Maybe my journey would not would have been a less, less of a struggle at that point in time if I'd had access to something mm. like that. Like 
from a personal perspective, I can't overstate how significant it is the mm. work that you're doing in terms of the space that you're creating there. And it's funny that we're talking about it because I met up with um, a mate yesterday morning, Fitzy, who does the boxing. We are mutual friends through I do jiu-jitsu. He does the boxing programs with you. And he, we were talking about the Spark Impact stuff that impact policy funds and you know just the importance of community development, all the principles we're talking about. And he brings up you and he goes... Um, talking about all the principles around access inclusion opportunity all the everything we're talking to and um he goes oh it's just you know it's like tomo's program he goes you know i've described it to friends about the boxing stuff i do he goes i could go anywhere to learn how to box he goes i live in bondi he's you know he's a very successful investor and um you know a champion of a bloke he could go anywhere to box he goes but i go to woolo and people ask me why and i said uh, you know, he, he does he does do the youth program he does yeah. another program yeah. that you've been a part of and he goes on any one day I could be boxing with an ex-Olympian ex-pro current pro current competing fighter or I could be training from someone who's coming out of the struggle they're recovering from you know serious addiction or they've you know had, had some been through some real struggles in their life um, and he goes but it's a real community space now where everybody is there for a shared purpose um and there's no um there's no issues around who people are and where people are from it's a safe and it's a accessible space for everyone mm -hmm. and he's like he's like tomo created that space he goes that wasn't there when i started coming here you know and um so it's funny we're talking about this because we caught up for coffee yesterday he said exactly this you know but it's um it's it's honestly like one thing i've learned in i was in the social sector for over 10 years and you don't do it for the thank yous because if you are you'll be gone very quickly you know um and i'm i'm a product of the system as a kid as well and i didn't say thank you a lot to a lot of people that were significant in my life on that journey and um so it just made me think like how important it is to acknowledge and recognize the 10 plus years that you've done just that pcyc you know and, and to say thank you to you for what you've done for the community and what you'll continue to do for the community, however that looks on your own journey. Um, because that's not why we're here. We're not here for the thank yous, but it's, it's critical every now and then we take time to reflect on the actual impact of what we're doing. Because mm. I think what you're doing there is, um, is so significant for those young people that are moving through and their broader communities as well they are seeing that journey whether they're going to your boxing program or not, some of their friends or some of their networks might be and they're watching from afar. Mm. You know, maybe in four or five years, they might be at a position where they're coming into a program when they're at that level or they're ready for that journey. So the impact that you're doing is massive for Wulo and the power of it again comes back to the consistency. Yeah. Like, and I would only say this because you've earned it. 10 plus years of being present and committed there. If this didn't do something for me, oh, well, I wouldn't do it because I'm human. And we totally. only do things that like, so like for me, it gives me balance. Mm. For me, it makes me feel good. For mm. me, me, mm. it, it allows me to put my head on the pillow each night and go and be okay. Definitely. Even if things haven't like, you know, other parts of my life haven't gone all right, I'm like, you know what? Mm. We're, uh, we're okay, you for know? Sure. And, and that's what volunteering does for me. Um, so, so I'm a huge advocate for people like taking some time out but mm. don't kid yourself yeah like yeah. don't kid yourself that I'm going to feed the homeless so oh, you know mm. flying you know, fly geez, they're, geez, they're they should be grateful yeah. you know yeah. like of the time I'm, I'm sacrificing mm. you know totally. you get to sacrifice and be where you are in this pyramid of our society because people are struggling and they're up the other end mate mm. you know what I mean like don't forget don't forget that you know Definitely. so so my big thing about volunteering is like yes absolutely and i, I get really humbled and, I, and thank you yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. For, for for your really kind words but i'm not kidding myself mm. like i'm not the man who i believe i am and i'm very confident in the man i am but mm. i'm not that without this yeah totally do you know what i mean like totally. it, it's an important ingredient for me and if i remove that part of my life mm. i I would struggle in the other parts. Totally. So people go, oh, the program needs you down there. Yeah, maybe it does, but I mm. need it just as much. Definitely. You know, and, and my whole thing with programs, the reality is my challenge with the program down there is being able to get it to be able to run without me. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, because that's legacy, right? Totally. You know, for, for me just to walk away, and you know, 
and, and to be fair, I look at the youth campus as, as an example of that, mm-hmm. you know, and yep. it's such Definitely. a great program. But the reality is, is I stepped away from that program and I'm not saying I was the be all and end all. Yeah. But when I challenged myself on it, I asked myself, did I put enough support and structures in place for when I walked away? Mm. And, and I thought I did. But mm. in reflection, oh, could I have done more? Yeah, maybe I could have done more. Mm-hmm. And that was a really good lesson for me because yeah. it, it was a pro, it was a program I was I know was making a difference. And I, like I, I've got proof of it because I'm still connected with the kids that I mentored in that program, and I see what's happened with them and mm. the lives that they, you know. But it's an expensive program to run. Totally. And cost you know, you know, really to do it properly, it's going to cost you. Four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year. That's yeah. you know, and we had wonderful support in the Matana Foundation. Um, just a um, uh, wonderful, wonderful group who, who give to some really, really good causes. Um, but you know, like anything with funding, you've got to continually mm. show your outcomes, continually show your output. And mm. um, whilst we were having that, you know, in reflection, I thought, okay, well, did I set that up for success as well as I could have? Mm. Um, and that's when I when I think about the boxing program, I, I think about that. You know, I've got to get it to a place where it doesn't rely on me. And I, I can't, I don't do it by myself. Like, mm. man, I'm so blessed. Like, mm. I've got people like you know Kenny Salisbury. Mm. Do yourself a favour and YouTube Kenny Salisbury. You know, yep. former Commonwealth um, Commonwealth boxing champion, and more importantly, maybe the nicest human yeah, the world's yeah. ever been graced with. Um, you know, um, Adam Bashar, another guy who helps me out. Um, um, Nate the King Carroll comes down yeah. when he can. You yep. know, um, the, the, these type of I can't do this stuff by myself. Totally. Um, so, um, but yeah, that is my challenge. That's my next challenge, and that's not to say I'm going to walk away, but that's my next challenge for sure. When you reflect on, I've been doing a lot of stuff in the flexible learning space. Yeah. So exactly what you talk about with the right passage um, flexible learning program at PCYC, doing some similar stuff in some different communities around New South Wales in terms of how we think about education. Um, you know, pathways for young people where the mainstream system's not working anymore. Mm. So your your examples, yeah, you know, I'm familiar with the history of that, and um, you know, a, a yarn around that another day would be really valuable. Mm. I often think of what happened in lockdown and the uh, homeschooling, the you know, the technological sort of revolution in terms of all that sort of stuff, and I. I was actually really um, refreshed to see a conversation around thinking differently around education because I just thought like, wow, what a great opportunity for us to to have some discussions around like, not to poke holes at the education system, but are there are there spaces where we can do this stuff better? You know, can we leverage, you know, growing, you know, um, presence of technology or flexibility, our whole um, thinking around flexible working and living and all that yeah. sort of stuff is shifting. So how does that how does that world look for our young people too and um, different things like that so hoping we can start to have some of those brave conversations yeah. right um, and but I think for a lot of stuff when we talk about this you know and, and that's one of the challenges at a policy level for mm. government is is um, you know we, we, we have them broad but at a, they, but they have to be we have to look at it at a local level in terms of how that impacts those communities right so yeah, it's worked well for that community there. There could be a range of demographic at that moment of time. and environmental yeah. and, and time sort of issues that, that reflected mm. that decision. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about rural, remote communities, central city communities, um, you know, communities with, you know, like cultural background and differences yeah. and all that sort of stuff that's going on, there's no reason why I don't think our communities can come together and have a conversation around determining what looks best for our people in, in our communities, you know, every day. I think they're hugely um, important because one of the consistent things that we saw through Youth Campus and why the, the right journey element of the broader Youth Campus was so important was it really helped these young people find their identity. Yeah. We've yeah. all been 14, 15, 16 months, right? Totally. Trying to find ourselves. You know, we, how much do we hear that cliche f- phrase? On Definitely. Who's trying to find themselves. Or let them travel so they can find themselves, all that type of thing. Yeah. Well, some people don't have the capacity to go travel. Totally. Some people have got these barriers where they, they, they literally can't overcome mm. to have an opportunity to even find themselves. They might be caring for a sick relative. Uh, they might, mm. you know, be in a home where there's a family violence situation. Whatever those these factors are, that TRJ element within within youth campus, one, we knew that one, if we could get the breakthroughs there, mm. like mm. have these kids find these little moments where they were finding themselves, 
the other stuff would the other stuff works itself out. You know, totally. You know, totally. Uh, well, mental. You know, and, and you come from you, know, you recently left the, you know, the department I work in, and, and they're big on the mentoring space, and I'm mm-hmm. part of the mentoring program there. And I'm always saying to my mentees there, you know, that you know, there's a reason on the aeroplane they tell you to put your mask on before you put sort of kits. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a roll on effect. If you're okay, and then you've got the capacity to do more. Totally. And I think. Um, you know, it's great that we're having these brave conversations around, um, you know, in, in particular around mental health and, and, and communicating mm. more broadly. I think we can do it a bit better in the youth space, you know, mm. in terms of our language and how we, how we do that. It's totally. not for the answers, but I think there's, there's some work that we can do there. But I know for a fact, just seeing it firsthand, mm. that I know once we've got that element right, where they were starting to find themselves and mm. understand their truth and... Mm. The other, the work just started. Oh my god! Oh, we got momentum now. Totally. But it started there. Totally. You know, the schoolwork was a drag. Mm. You know, for the first, always the first term of youth campus, it was yeah. a drag. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. it was more the same. <laughs> but then we had these really productive kind of TRJ sessions, and then they'd have the energy about. Mm. They'd have mm. a bit of front, you know. Totally. It's like, oh, okay. We got a bit of confidence. You can be yourself now. Let's go. Definitely. And then they were, they, they, they just carried on. You know, mm. it wasn't like, oh, you know, some kids, oh, they they go great at PE and then they're just rubbish at science and maths yeah. or whatever. No, that didn't happen. Like, yeah. There was a flow on effect of, okay, they're starting to know themselves a bit better. They're getting their confidence mm. up. Um, that's going to flow on. So I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. But I certainly know that identity and I think we see that, you know, with, you know, I'm, I'm a proud Maldi man, mm. you know, um, you know. I'm, I'm working really hard. I'm going to do a today Maori course this year to learn my Mad. language a bit better. And but I know that identity is really important to me, and that's just part of my totally. identity. That that means different things to different people. Yep. Um, but there's a strength in that. Definitely. And having that connection to identity, totally. you know, whatever that is, cultural identity, you know, um, you know, ethical identity, whatever that is. Mm. But that connection to that, there's totally. strength in that, and we can pro- and that flexible learning space is a real opportunity mm. for us to explore that definitely that's good it's good you're doing the work yourself you know later mm. in life too like and not just some people get you know into their 30s and they just you know 40s 50s and that's it they just are who they are and mm. they fell into whoever that is you know and i'm always really proud of hearing those exactly what you just said because you know i've got a few friends myself even going down that journey and for us it's not about ourselves as much as it is for our kids mm. right i know you've got two young ones yeah so um your identity um culturally is 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 greatly going to inform their identity of who they are culturally and everything Mm. because because of that journey you've gone on it's that flow on effect right we talk about and um yeah intergenerational trauma there's a there's a a formula that does that now Mm. why can't we take that formula Mm. and shift it into something positive totally in the same way that that intergenerational trauma gets carried on generation to generation Mm. what's stopping us from taking that formula mm. and applying it to something positive, like in terms of, Definitely. you know, uh, I'm going on a bit of a journey at the moment. Did the, one of those ancestry DNA tests? Yeah, you know, yeah. One of those, yeah. yeah. And because um, I don't know my father, um, okay. my mum uh, got pregnant with me when she was 15. Yeah. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, he did the he did the Harold Holt. Yeah. Um, don't know him. Don't know the family. Mum never kind of had the. She was a kid. Yep. Never had the capacity to understand to maintain Navigate contact. All that. Yep. All of that. And um, no Facebook back then. No Facebook back. None of that, bros. Yeah. So um, I did this thing, and I've connected with these people. You know, uh, yeah, okay. Like, oh, okay, hold on, and yeah, yeah, yeah. suddenly look at family tree. I, I, I haven't got there yet, but I'm not doing it because I, I, I don't need mm. a father in my life at this point in my life. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got my father-in-law. I'm really blessed. I've got a great father-in-law. But yeah. as far as male role models in my life, I'm I've got plenty of mm. wonderful blokes in my life. Guys like yourself and other. And other and other brothers and, and and people I look up to, so it's not really about that. But I don't want my kids mm. to go. Oh, I never tried. Yeah, yep. Like yep. We've got a whole part of our history we don't know about, and Dad never even really even looked at it. Yep, um, definitely. And that's kind of why I'm doing it. I could care less if I find this person, you mm. know, who got my mum pregnant. But that I, I I want to be able to tell my kids. Well, you know what? We actually I found out that you know our ancestry on, on that it came from Scotland and mm. you know and, mm. and just to give him something you know definitely. what I mean that I can you know rather than having a mystery definitely which happens to so much of our generation right for there's sure. a mystery past our parents because they didn't talk for sure didn't share things you yeah. know um, that's right so so yeah I, 
development in these older years, it's hard yeah. to find time, but I think it's important you do, you know, in whatever it is. Yeah. Definitely. And you're giving you're giving your young ones permission in a sense, right? Because when you're actively seeking um, to connect as much dots as you can mm. because of the value of that that you know for yourself in future generations to not just cut a, li- a whole part of yourself off. Yeah. You, get, you give your kids permission to, regardless of however far you get in that journey, it's a sense of value and pride mm. in that part of yourself because yeah. no matter how that relationship came about where you came into the world, you talk about intergenerational trauma and all mm. that sort of stuff. Well, you know, it doesn't take away the fact that there's there's thousands of years of lineage that has brought you to where you are right now mm. and it's a powerful thing right i know it's powerful because yeah. like on the maori side of my heritage mm. i know it deep you know totally. what i mean my grandfather you know passed it on and my mom mm. and talks about it and my mom's teaching my kids how to speak and yeah uh, e- 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 the language and but you know we had we've got my eyes back home we have yeah. family reunions i'm connected to people i understand my history i've seen mm. family trees like all of that and totally. I, like, I find great strength i know when i step back home um you know uh I guess our iwi or our mob, as yeah, you yeah. say, is uh, the Nai Tai, which is kind of just south of Auckland and uh, around the Papakura area. And um, but I know when I get to that place and I put my feet on the ground mm. there, there's a different there's a different mm. feel to it. Hundred percent. But that feel wouldn't be there if I didn't know the history, right? I wasn't totally. Connected. Totally. You know, and, and there's like just a great power in that. You know, mm. I just um, you know that's I always say you know. Everyone has family, but Maori have Fano, you know. And, yeah. and when I go back home, you know, and I put my feet on that ground, it, like even though I've been here my whole life, yeah, like that feels like home to me. You totally, know? totally. And that's that identity we talked about, right? Like I'm, I'm, I feel so blessed and grateful to have that as part Man. of my life. That culture is part of my life, you know. Definitely. And I want my kids to have that, but I want Definitely. them to have the whole story, you know. Hundred percent. Not to have half of it. Totally. Mm. Most recently, before coming together today, we worked together as part of this, well, not directly together, but part of the same beast. Yeah. Um, doing some really good stuff um, at the time at DPI. So I'd love to hear about a little bit about your, your public servant sort of journey because that's directly where you went after PCYC into the gov- state government. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So I. Um I, uh, out of PCYC, funnily enough, I, I went in and worked into the New South Wales Police Media Unit and yeah, okay. had um, two kind of really insightful, great years um, there. Um, number of roles kind of, you know, floated in different portfolios, but it was really great. I got a kind of good lens on it. And, you know, you're dealing with some pretty heavy stuff in there. So mm. um, it, it was, uh, yeah, no, it was high paced. And it was good. Like, it was the kind mm. of jolt I needed to get yeah. back into what <laughs> I was used to. You know, I'm used to being yeah. in a newsroom or, you know, that really chaotic environment. And New South Wales Police is definitely that. So mm. I did that for a couple of years. Um, yeah, that was really interesting because, you know, um, you know, friends groups where we grew up all those type of things the mm. connotations that come with that mm. um you know i was working with the police when we were well, you know there was these really yeah, really yeah. strong protests through the city around yep. police violence obviously what happened from a george lloyd perspective and mm. how that kind of flew on through into yeah, different yeah. parts of the world including in sydney etc so i was there during that time and, and that was that was an interesting time right yeah you know, how hard would that be for you working in that space being someone who comes from you know from a cultural perspective yep. bringing that lens of what that lived experience can be but also the community perspective and stuff I, I think the one thing it did and certainly you know uh, my role there isn't a public facing one by any stretch but um i'd like to think i, I had a deep empathy mm-hmm. you know and, I, and I, i've got an empathy first approach anyone that works with me knows me knows mm-hmm. that that's always my first instinct is empathy not sympathy but empathy mm-hmm. um so and i also understand like you know what's hard for you might not be hard for me but it's still hard for you Mm -hmm. and um so i think the work that i did during that time um i i didn't find it all that difficult or conflicting from my perspective Mm -hmm. because i that's my job you know my job was to work you know that's why i got paid up i um you know and the biggest thing i guess my, my work in the background is just talking about how we're communicating yeah, you know yeah. how can we best communicate and give people space and um there was a lot of flexibility shown i think from during that time and take into account we're going in the middle of a pandemic yeah, and all yeah, these type yeah. of things i actually was really proud of um the way that all parties actually genuinely 
collaborated. Yep. Like, yeah, there were protests happening and all these type of things, but there was yeah. people who were working here who they had differing point of views. They, totally. they absolutely did. But they wanted to make sure, and I can say this, like the main priority was safety. Like it really yeah. was. Like from where we were, we wanted to make sure, okay, this is going to happen. Mm. So let's just make sure it's as safe or, yeah. you know, as it can as be. And people are going to want to express themselves and that's okay. Yeah. You know, we've got to make it a safe space. So, yeah, that was, that was an interesting time. Once again, really great for professional development. Mm. It's kind of working through all that. Because yeah, there was a lot sure. of crossover for me, you know. Massively. You know, I'm walking along with the police. A lot of my friends are walking in that march, you know yeah, what I mean? So, totally. you know, so, but that's okay. People who know me know my character. They know my values. Yeah, I don't totally. have to justify that to anyone. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, that was good. And then, yeah, I did two years there and then found my way over to, um, yeah, the, the DPI at the time, which is now yeah. DPE. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And work in the social housing space, which was not by design by any mm. stretch of the imagination. Back to um, where it all began. But yeah, it's funny yeah. how it works, right? You know, totally. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a proud product of social housing. Mm. And um, I I think what I brought to that space was that real understanding. You yeah, know, yeah. we've all worked with the public service. I'm not the first person who's come out of social housing and work in public totally, service. But totally. the fact that my job was to manage the messaging on how mm. we talk about it. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, it's been really interesting and, uh, and it has absolutely enabled me. That lens that you kind of touched on before, um, yeah. I think it's it's absolutely helped me do my job um, day to day um, in there. I, I am very conscious though, mate. I do separate it. I think that's important. Um, yeah. I'm not, I've, and I'll share this quote because it was a good one, you know. Yeah. Um, a uh, good mate of mine, uh, he scored this really great job, high-profile pro- high job, and he's being interviewed by someone about it. And they said, mate, you've got the best job in the world, man. You must just love your job. Yeah. And he said, eh, yeah, well, I love my kids. Yeah. And I love my wife. And I love my family. I love my friends. I don't love my job, but I love being really good at it. Yeah. And that absolutely resonated with me. You know, yeah, yeah, totally. you know, I, I find it really easy to switch off. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, how do you switch? Oh, yeah, no worries, mate. You know, yeah. you know, with my time with the cops, I had to. You know, mm. I'm sitting there reading, um, you know, really sensitive things, traumatic mm. things. You know, with some of the squads that do some great work in you know, the child abuse and sex crime squad. You know, you got to read mm. the details. That's some heavy stuff. You got to read. You know, mm. totally. Um, so that capacity to be able to desensitize and desen- we'll off. just switch off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's my job. That's yeah. my job. You know, and I certainly apply that to my current work. But there's no question, my deep understanding of social housing, mm. being a product of it, and understanding community, yeah, certainly does assist with with my work for sure. You said a couple of things there. I just want to pick up one, and I made a note earlier when you were talking about um, what you get out of volunteering, mm. and you're like, um, you said something about like, like I get, I'm getting something out of this, you know. Mm. Um, personally you know a number of things you you sort of said and i nodded i jotted it down because and then you use the you use an example of don't just stick your hand up and run go to a soup kitchen and think you've saved the world sort of thing you you weren't as blunt as that but um and it and it made me think about like how important it is what resonated with me when you said that i'm gonna i'll link it back to what you're talking about now is it's about thinking about community development volunteering um charity as strengths based mm. right like we see a lot of deficits dialogue <laughs> in how we describe social housing community development and all that sort of go help the poor kids you know go fix the poor problems in the houses all that sort of stuff when you said that stuff about yourself and you're very honest and transparent mm. like i'm getting something out of this what you're saying is like there's strength in being a part of this and they're giving me that strength you know and and i thought that was i thought that was it was so natural that you said it but so powerful because it's something that is so overlooked in terms of how we communicate um, messaging strategy um, program orientation around how we think about solving problems we often look we look at the problems yeah you know we don't look at what's working or the strengths or the existing solutions so then I bring it back to the housing stuff because you talk about you talked about um, coming in and bringing the lens in from that sort of perspective as well and having that lived experience and connection I remember reading a post you put up on LinkedIn one day talking about how you slept your mum put you in a 
a cupboard when you were a baby in a drawer because times were tough mm. you know like that was just a reality at, at a small stage in your in your journey like you've come from the struggle right but you know that there's so much strength in our communities because we've seen it you know we're products of it um and and then we've also we also had we have had some off conv- offhand conversations working together around um the the significance of being strategic in our communications and thinking differently about how we can do that sort of stuff to help either inform policy delivery or managing media communications mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff and what i'd love to hear is just any any sort of perspectives or reflections you have around around communications in the social housing space and mm-hmm. how um, we can think about it from a strengths sort of space um, as opposed to a problem orientated sort of disadvantaged lens that we often you know is stereotypically thought yeah. about when we talk about social housing because we know that there's so many great social housing case studies and examples of communities that are thriving yeah, yeah. there are issues across like anywhere in the world um, but yeah I'd love to hear your insights I, I think one of the biggest things right for me which is consistent from 30 years ago when you know well, nearly 40 years ago now <laughs> who's counting oh, yeah. who's counting right um i've been in social housing to meeting some social housing i mean i know social housing but but actually going in and you know looking at through that lens is the one really consistent thing is community right mm. and the strength that they're connected mm. now if you just go to a more affluent suburb there's a massive chance that the neighbors don't know each other they don't talk to each other mm. they wouldn't know the person next door let alone someone three doors down mm. Now, if you go down Waterloo, you know, mm. and, um, you know, you've, I saw a sad story on the news um, about a, a person who passed away, I and mean, I think a fire, you know, something, whatever, whatever might have happened and transpired. But they spoke to all the neighbours and they spoke with such affinity mm. a, and genuine mm. sadness and and actually genuinely knew this person. Mm. This wasn't someone that they go, oh, yeah, they lived two doors down, didn't hear from them much, but... Yeah. Yeah. So sort of when I was walking the dog every now and then. Yeah, yeah. They know each other. Mm. And that is actually, that's community, mate. Totally. Like, I know, like, mum had to work two jobs at a time or, like, work really late hours when we were young. It wasn't uncommon for me just to flick over to the neighbour's house or mm. or down, three doors down and yeah. stay with them until mum got finished and then they bring us back home. Totally. That doesn't happen now, mate. Totally. Like, like that's, that doesn't happen, you know. Yeah. But it still happens in housing. Yeah, yeah that sense of community, we're going to look after each other. And sometimes that passion is sometimes misguided, I think, you know, obviously, you know, that mm. loyalty and mm. passion, sometimes we can probably do do well to redivert <laughs> some of that sometimes. Yeah. Is, but that is a strength, mate. Totally. Just because it might be utilised in some ways that might be antisocial or, or, mm. or, or not beneficial to the individual or, or the wider community, mm. there's a strength in the method. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. It's a bit like I was talking about intergenerational tra- trauma. Let's... Yeah. It's a method. It's worked. Mm, totally. Something that got passed on and passed on. Well, how can we apply that positively? Mm. That's probably my biggest thing is like, let's let's tap into that. Especially mm. when you talk about community consultation and, and these type of things. Let's lean... That's a strength. These people are talking to each other. They've got constant mm. dialogue. Mm. They get strength in numbers because they're really ready to come together mm. at any time mm. on any issue. Totally. They will back each other up 100%. Totally. totally. You know? I see my mum and I tell her sometimes like she's fired up ready to go to a protest or something. I said, Mum, and I'll tell her, you know, I'll give her a bit of context. She's like, oh, I didn't really know that. I was just going to support my friend. Yeah. But that's a strength. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. Totally. So if we can empower them to be more part of the decision-making process, and um, mm-hmm. we both know, like they are, in terms mm-hmm. of community consultation, it's a pretty rigorous process yep. um, and robust process. But, you know, I think the more we can lean into that, Mm. You know, I, I think what you'll find is, you know, there's a real benefit to mm. that. You know, the, the data Definitely. doesn't lie. Like, we've got to make decisions mm. based on some of these, the analytics that we get. In, yeah. You know, and social housing is a good point of that. You know, it's a, social housing is changing in terms mm. of the people who need it. You know, it's a lot of the large demographic are older, single people, going to have mobility issues who want to age in place. Mm. So, so we know that. Mm. So that changes who we kind of talk to. Yes, there's a massive waiting list, but that's just a reality of the changing face. Mm. you know of you know uh, of social housing so that's obviously something you've got to take into account you take that in, into account in any kind of strategic comms or media plan in terms of okay well who's our audience how are yep. we best you know um you know so i was looking at it the other day the aboriginal housing office they do such a great job on social media yeah, yeah really yeah. good because yeah. they know they're talking to mm. they're using language that 
resonates with their audience. Totally. Which means it gets taken in more, you know? Totally. So th- th- that's really important. But you're 100% right in terms of we can identify so there's some real strength, mm. you know? And people like us don't land where we are if we haven't acquired that strength from somewhere. Yeah, definitely. In terms of, you know, uh, getting to just at this point of our lives and, and not having the outcomes that some of our mm. you know, contemporaries, For sure. you know, or people we grew up with had. For sure. Know? That came from somewhere. Well, yeah. We didn't just pluck that out of the sky, walk past the shop one day, pick her up. Like totally. that. We got that from our lived experience. Mm. So we've just, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, I think the work that you're starting to do now is really going to kind of open that space up a little bit more. Of mm. How can we learn from these people? You know, you yeah. hear about old people, especially mob, you know, I, I, mm. I love listening to, to, to you know, people um, like Noel Pearson and people talk. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and like, let's let's lean in to learn these lessons. Like mm. this is the the oldest living, mm. ongoing culture in the world. Totally, it survived this long. Why are we listening to them? Let's yeah. let's listen to what they have to say. Totally, it doesn't mean we're always going to agree. It doesn't matter. But mm. let's listen. Let's listen. You know, definitely. There's a re- there's a there's survival has brought tra- trauma, mm. but survival is that's a strength in survival, man. Definitely, <laughs> it's a good example you make about the Aboriginal Housing Office and how they sort of made their engagement with community, and um. And you know, obviously, they they they've been designed right to provide a specific service for a specific demographic in the state, um, and so yeah, so right, their com their comms and their media is designed to manage to speak to that audience like you talk to. Um, so I imagine like the complexities are quite challenging, right, in your space in social housing when you're trying to. Um, I mean, you made the reference of the old aging residents and shaping messages for that, but yeah. like. You know, you have you have any potential like perspectives or ideas around how we can you know you talked about the strength of community and the value that they can add and, mm. and the reference to you know your mum's experiences and stuff and things like that but I'm just trying to think like you know when we talk about like um, youth housing or uh, different communities and stuff like that are there any ways that we can really start to think a bit differently about how we've done stuff traditionally um, whether from a strategic perspective or even just from, yeah, thinking a bit differently about comms and media. Yeah, look, I mean, as far as that policy end of it, it's probably well outside my my lane in terms of um, kind of where my head would be at mm. from a strategic point of view. Um, but certainly from a way we speak to people, you know, I kind of look at it in simple terms. My friend circle is super diverse, mm. super diverse. And um, I am always authentically me. Mm. But say if I'm speaking to a young person, for instance, I'm going to tweak my language so mm. that they can hear me. Totally. You know, and I think that's that's one of the, the uh, uh, that's a real challenge. I think just in comms generally, yeah. especially when you've got a, an audience or a message that's going to impact different audiences. Yep. So you really have to put in the work in terms of okay, well, how's this? How can we get make sure this lands and hits the mark with this particular audience? Mm. And some, it's inevitable that you don't hit everyone. Yeah, you, you just have to come to terms with that. You know what I mean? Definitely. Um, you have to come to terms with that. You can't always hit everyone with the type of messaging that you want to. Mm. You kind of it's a numbers game. Yeah. You know, <laughs> database. How can yeah, we get yeah. the majority? But let's capture as many people as we can. You know. Totally. A- a- and you apply that lens. But I think, in those simple terms, like then the words, the message doesn't change. Sometimes you just mm. got to tweak the way you say it. You know. Yeah. You know, yeah. People will, will you know so often receive their news just on a ups. Twitter feed or a Facebook update. Yeah. Like, they're taking in information what we're used to taking in information in a newspaper article of yeah. 600 words. Yeah. People are getting in 140 characters. Now, yeah. there's flaws with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. There's massive flaws with totally. that. But that is the reality. It's, um, you know, they call it a snack culture. We, we've 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 decided that we just want small snack bites of information. Mm. Um, I think podcasting, funnily, sitting here is kind of bending that trend in terms of long form. I think yeah. it's, it's good to see because yep. um, it gives that context and it's kind of changing the way people have kind of approach things. Mm. Um, the Joe Rogan thing's really interesting at the yeah, moment. Yeah, seeing totally. all that play out because totally. you know, a lot of his critics and on the, you know, obviously he's got some flaws. He's acknowledged those things, but yep. a lot of his critics aren't listening to the whole podcast. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? They're not yeah, they're, totally. they're listening to the whole thing. So, so that idea of, you know, retraining, I guess, communication, but it's also we've comms and media, they've got to adjust to the landscape, right? Mm. So people are going to take an information. Well, how can I 
well, now I've got to do something for this space. Yeah, I've got to do something 140 characters. I've also got to make sure I cover off for the audience that listen, taking their information on the news each night. Yeah. There's still a million, you know, millions of people each night are tuning at six o'clock to watch the news. Totally. You know, there's still a million people that pick up the Daily Telegraph and read that thing or, mm. you know, hundreds of thousands of people that pick up Sydney Morning. There's still audiences that do that stuff. Totally. There's audiences that are just going off a... They won't even click on the link because it's a paywall, but they're just yeah. looking at the headline. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah, totally. You've got to cater for them too. Totally. So, yeah, look, it's com- it's, there's no question it's complex and you never, ever, you know, you're never, ever going to... Mm. It's never going to be perfect. You're totally. never going to get it perfect. There's just no way. Can I ask your perspectives around... A big part of what we do at Impact Policy is, is digital communications, storytelling. We do a lot of stuff with um, the public sector... Um, around communicating case studies around what's worked really well and helping that to inform messaging and communications with external stakeholders. Um, we part, we know, with Amanaki Studios who are producing this podcast, do different things as well. They've done a range of different things too um, for state government. And talking about all that stuff that you've talked to there in terms of messaging and stuff and I guess, you know, the references to Twitter and we're seeing social media grow. One thing I'm seeing from, I guess, my journey is 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 the rise of the impact of um you know video in terms of you know we talk about storytelling we talk about um you know really communicating clearly some of those core messages and connecting directly with the you know the hearts and minds of those you know audiences you're trying to trying to connect to um what's your perspectives in terms of that space in when you when you think about media and communications broadly its future the role of video in that space in terms of messaging how do you see it look i think the big thing with any kind of i think the big thing with any strategy whether it's constant media or anything else is outcome backwards right yeah this is where we want to land okay mm-hmm. now let's work out how we do that yeah you know so that, that that's probably the first thing video is massively important especially as the quality of uh, you know most people are taking their information on their phones Mm -hmm. um so but they're prepared to as we're saying the rise of podcasts etc those longer forms they're absolutely ready to do that but i think some of the principles of good video content are the same yeah Um, yeah and andrew has probably heard me bang on about this many a times before but you know i know a good producer said to me once when i was i was doing an on-air piece like i took him and it was like three minutes 30 and I was like man this is so good the pictures are amazing yeah. he goes he didn't everybody goes if it's good at 3.30 it would be great at 2.30 so I went away and I cut it back and yeah. brought it back said oh man it's awesome like you're yeah. right yeah. 2.30 goes well if it's great at 2.30 it'll be incredible at a minute 30 yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then I went back and I cut yeah. it back again Your social cut going yeah. you know getting it right down right yeah. and I took it back and he, he sat there and he watched it and he goes mate this is the best piece of, that you've ever done Yeah. I went okay you know, because we can get a bit indulgent, especially in this time where there's so much self-creation in terms of content. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. You know, you find it hard to separate yourself from it. You totally. Know? My biggest advice is always get maybe an untrained or someone who isn't so attached to the content yep. to have a look at it. Because that's Definitely. who's going to that's who's going to look at it, right? That's, that's who it. you're sending it to. Totally. So I'm always big on having a blind, basically blind lens come in just look at it and go oh yeah that's pretty good like someone mm-hmm. who's real honest with you yeah just to look at it and go yeah man i didn't really quite get that bit and then you ask yourself well, bring yourself back to the outcome well what do i want to achieve at the end of them watching it yeah yeah and if you didn't achieve that from someone just watching it off scratch well okay well i probably need to do a bit more work i probably need to simplify mm. the message a little bit more totally like pe- people go oh they have a go at like the scomos and all this for you know the yeah. catchphrase messaging and stuff yeah, yeah, yeah there's a reason why they keep doing it yeah because people remember it yeah and if you want anything with kind of especially the kind of content that, that you're undoubtedly going to be making you want it to have an impact yeah and you want people to remember it totally totally people talk about oh sorry about using that cliche it's a cliche for a reason because yeah. everyone gets it yeah do you know what I mean like yeah. the challenge of the English language is to look at different ways to be able to skin a cat right and you want yeah. to be able to say things differently but but they need to at the end of the day what's your outcome I need to understand whatever it is I'm talking about mm so so my biggest advice is regardless of the length of the content that you're making mm. do do i achieve my outcome in which is often making the person watching it yeah understand what i'm trying to say definitely and, and you yeah, come from a policy background and i work with policy people every day yeah you know they're in their own stuff you know what i mean totally. so my job big like every day is yeah. to take what the magnificent work that they're doing 
and transfer it into something that everyone's going to understand. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. So, Definitely. so I, I think that's really, really important with content. Because the last thing you want people walking away from watching a video is confused. Yeah. You know, you don't go watch a movie where you watch the trailer and go, I don't really get the storyline. Yeah, yeah. You don't go and see it. Definitely. You know what I mean? Like, unless The Rock or someone's in it or something. Yeah. Kevin Hart or something. But you don't go watch it because yeah. I didn't really get the trailer. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Totally. You know? And then they can dodge it because that premise of, oh, something that was great at, you know, 3.30 is going to be really good at 1.30. Mm. Sometimes they've just got a really good trailer and they dodge yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. You watch the whole thing. Totally. I did the Sopranos movie the other day. It was horrible. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, um, but yeah, that idea of outcome back so keep challenging mm. yourself or did they would they understand what i'm actually the whole effort all the production yeah. the hours yeah. the scripts the everything did it get to my outcome because if it mm. didn't then it, it's in some ways if you're going to be really critical of yourself it's a failure totally totally yeah it's a, it, look it's it's a really good reflection and we're doing some similar stuff at the moment we produced some comms for roads to home you know it's a premier's priority yeah good um, program Great you know program. it's yeah. a um yeah, Premier's priority, re-election commitment, uh, high profile um, and quite complex in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, and so comms was really valuable in that space from a video perspective in terms of communicating the complexity and the impact of that project for multiple audiences. You know, you've got the um, complexity of the history of missions and reserves for our people um, and understanding that in the space of this broader infrastructure upgrade program and why it exists um but i think you're completely right as well because we've produced communications that sort of you know will help inform that process strategically long term internally for you know different things yep. that are happening for them um but it makes me think in terms of you know your example of the 320 the 220 the 130 you know, it's it's a real art and skill to be able to take something that is also complex, and but be able to really nail those key takeaways um, in a way where you're not you're not losing too much depth, mm. um, and in a lot of ways can also have more, more power and impact, right? Yeah. Um, because the engagement is higher, uh, and I think that's something that we see. We uh, we often I think in 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 our space when we're producing stuff. Sometimes we'll come in and we'll just produce, say, the case study. We won't do the social cut. And so we'll come in with a lens. You know, if I'm doing stuff in the you know, um, Aboriginal affairs space, I'm bringing a whole cultural lens to how I'm communicating that case study and that story and the impact and the layers with that lens. Mm. So it has that, um, like you said, you know, when people, they, um, they put a lot of, you know, stuff in it that um, someone that's coming out from the outside, you know, maybe they're not sort of coming across that digressing a bit what i'm trying to say is um i've seen in the past where we've come in and say produced a case study yep and then internal comms has done their own social cut and um and you watch it uh from a you know from a producer perspective from a cultural perspective and you just think oh no you've missed yep you've missed the core message piece here yeah, yeah. for our external stakeholders you yeah. know you, whether it's the cultural lens, maybe they've yep. just focused on program delivery and they've missed the yep. significant impact or something like that. Um, but it's definitely an emerging issue I'm noticing when we talk about this sort of space. Mm. And um, I think it's just been a nice reflection. You give me a lot to think about as well, just because we're seeing the, the growth and the interest in terms of the need and the prevalence of it. But I think what we need to get better as, um, as well for ourselves here is, is being really... Um, forthcoming in in how present these pieces are in terms of um producing social cuts as well so that those yep. you know those core lenses and, and and messages aren't lost and i think along the, way. the other thing is is don't get the message confused with the outcome yeah yeah okay because we can get real tied to the message because we think oh well that's the only way to get to the outcome mm. sometimes you get a piece of video content that has no words yeah you know a great example is the opening scene in love actually right yeah when you've got all the families coming to the airport, no one's saying anything. Mm. Just vision of people coming together. Mm. But you walk away from that going, oh, oh, you know, I love that feeling. Yeah. When I'm at the airport, I haven't seen my missus or, or yeah, family yeah. members in a long time. Totally. Doesn't need words. Doesn't need... And it, and it achieved the outcome. Yeah. Which to make me feel something. Yeah, okay? totally. So that's, there's, a, there's a delineation between the two things. Mm. There's a message, yeah. which is your vehicle to get an outcome. Definitely. And the outcome is for people to better understand something, is is to feel something, to have mm. empathy, mm. you know. Um, 
you know, when we're talking about, you know, a lot of the content that you're talking about, and, I, and I've seen a lot of it, or yeah, whatever, yeah. it's once again, okay, well, are we trying to, um, is our priority to inform mob that we're working on mm. this stuff? Mm. Or is our priority um, to better educate non-Indigenous people mm. about the work that we're doing? Yeah, totally. And actually asking yourself that question, right? And, and mm. something may have to give. Yeah, definitely. You may have to, re- okay, well, you know what? Well, actually, the social cut, that's for this. This is mm. that's for this purpose, which mm. is to maybe um, for non-indigenous Australians to better understand the, the challenges, or whatever it might be, the, or the work that's been done. But then you'll go, well, um, this piece of thing that's going out through these particular channels that will land with um, with in, an indigenous audience. Well, we can we can go into other facets. Mm. Message mm. doesn't change; mm. just the vehicle of which they will receive that message. You know, yeah, what I mean? definitely. So it, it n- p- people often get it mixed up mm. in comms they think the message is the outcome and people receiving it. the message is the vehicle yeah the outcome is the outcome totally what am i trying to what am i trying to achieve here what what i want them to feel what i want them to understand mm. what i want them to remember because mm. that's co- good content is content people remember what i want them to remember so totally. that's probably regardless of the length length is you know whatever mm. um that's actually the important bit don't get it mixed up yeah the message totally. ain't the outcome totally totally and so what's the future look like for you a lot of change has been happening recently in the public sector particularly at you know um, department of planning industry and environment where we've been at mm-hmm. um how's things going what's the future look like how's the boxing going like what's world right now look like for for tomo the world is good the world is good my family's healthy we've come out of this kind of i genuinely think we're coming out of the other side of this mm. bloody pandemic thing yep. you know um um Work is my work. You know, I've touched on it before, you know. You know. I don't necessarily have to love my job, but I love being good at it. I, yeah. I think I go and eat to work each day and I'm pretty good at it. Um, so I'll keep doing that. Um, I'm a big believer on things will take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. That's not a blind faith thing. I just think if I work hard every day and, yeah. you know, it's funny, I, my daughter just got, um, you know, asked to be a part of a kind of uh, high potential, you know, um, she she get, group, she'd, you she'd know? get that from her mother, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, group and she was like she didn't quite get the context she's only in year one yeah, you know of but she didn't really understand the context and my big message was like you know I didn't want her to think oh I'm just natural and oh, I got in I said mate you work bloody hard mm. you know and now because you work very hard it's been recognised and now you've been asked to go into this special group of students and yeah. you get to do some other stuff about the things that you really love doing and, and, and what not and yeah, that's that's for that, that's all it is for me from work perspective. I mean, mm. this weekend is a real milestone uh, weekend um, for me as far as our boxing program goes. And one of the young kids who started with me started with me when I first started. He was yeah. about 14, 15. He's trying to go to the Commonwealth Games this weekend. He's yeah, got wow. Commonwealth Games trials. And yeah, wow. He was the first uh, kid in like twenty eight years, like junior, to win a state title for, yeah. at Woolloomooloo. Yeah. Um, um, he's just a tremendous kid, and I'm super proud to you know be a part of his life beyond boxing um but uh, that's a really big moment uh, for our club and our program he represents all that's good about it you know he came to us as a school kid yeah you know never really done any boxing before and you know and um he's kind of stayed committed show the hard work and as other kids are falling away maybe kids are more talented than him he just stayed and he was consistent and totally um he's now bearing the fruits of that and he's a great kid he's juggling his apprenticeship with his dreams to go to the olympics and the commonwealth games and um, you know, he helps out around the club. He volunteers. You've yeah. seen him in there yeah, helping definitely. the young kids and yeah. stuff like that. And w- the biggest thing for me is, yeah, he's got this really big boxing moment, but it represents more mm. than boxing um, for me, for him, and for us as a collective group. Um, definitely. definitely, it represents potential. You know, it represents, you know, um, what's possible if you kind of stay and you. you it's consistent and you work hard and totally. it's the example that I want all my other kids and, and you can be a good person you know there's no dickhead policy as you know yeah, mate totally. tough guys don't last too long in my gym they yeah. get out tough pretty quick yeah. they get sent packing so totally um, you know he, he's the best best example of that so mm. yeah really proud so mate we'll, we'll just keep doing our best you know down there keep connecting with community and um, yeah life is good man life is good I'm yeah, for, forever grateful man forever grateful yeah, um, awesome. for, you know from where you know guys like you you and i come from to mm. to be in a place where i'm today to have you know a partner of nearly 20 years now my yeah. wife and i've been together have a couple of really healthy kids um you know one's a great student one's a bit more of a meathead um, <laughs> but that's okay we love them both um yeah I, yeah i feel really blessed mate really blessed yeah and grateful for sure 
So if people want to know a bit more about the boxing program, things like that, sounds like um, the fighter you've got, you know, is some big milestones coming up. Um, it is a community program, right? It's it run is. by volunteers. Yep. Um, and all that sort of stuff. So if, if, if there's people watching here, you know, um, that are a part of this broader impact policy network that want to reach out yep. to support in any way, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, we've got our Woolo Boxing, which is on um, on Instagram. We've got a Woolamaloo Boxing uh, team page on Facebook. Yeah, encourage you to get in contact. Um, one of the big things is we never turn anyone away. I mean, yep. that's always been a real benchmark for PCYC you know, when I was growing up and got dragged in by a copper. Yeah. You know, it was like, you know, we didn't have the money to pay for fees or whatever, but... We looked after it, so um, we absolutely look after the young people. There'll, there'll mm. never be a young kid. I don't care who's never boxed before. I never said no to anyone. So, yeah. Um, yeah, come on down. But you know, also I encourage people if you think you can add value, you know, not just to our program but the club. Um, you know, the club needs support. You know, there there's clubs, all these PCYC clubs. So whether you're in the inner city or whether you're in somewhere like Dubbo or, or yeah. Walgett or or wherever these clubs are self-sustaining they need every bit of community support that they can to, mm. to just get through their business day to day so yeah, totally. um, the PCYC New South Wales uh, mission at its core is to empower young people mm. and they've been doing it for a long time man uh, like I'm a big advocate for it you know um, and um, yeah, I'm really really proud to be a part of that organisation in a volunteer capacity for sure yeah man alright well when this goes live anyway you know you'll be You'll be you'll be tagged, and I'll make sure your details are up there as well. If anyone wants to reach out and connect with you on LinkedIn Not or any other platforms, no, just get like the mobs off there. We are. <laughs> yeah, put your address down. Yeah, exactly too. right. Yeah, you get a couple um, visitors real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, look again, bro. Just thank you so much for making the time. It's a real privilege to have seen your journey, to have been a small part of connecting with you throughout that process. And I'm just excited to stay connected and see where the next stages of it go. So Yeah, really proud of you and congratulations on the podcast and oh, all the things you're doing, you. mate. Yeah, really, really, really proud of you. My guy. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>